Hello everyone and welcome back to History 11. Custer died for your sins, a brief history of Native American people in the Americas. So this discussion and this lecture is about uh, the history of Native American peoples in North America. And this is not a comprehensive lecture, but an overview to introduce a couple of topics uh, one being hegemony and the other being genocide that you'll need to kind of be aware of. But tackling this with the Native Americans helps us to kill kind of two birds with one stone in the sense that we ought to talk literally about Native American peoples in, in some larger context. And then we also should be able to introduce these content, concepts of hegemony and uh, genocide so that when you get to your assignments, you'll be able to write specifically uh, about this particular uh, topic in some way that gives you um, sort of an ideological or, or, or an academic way to respond to the prompts. Um, I took the title for this Custer Dies for Your Sins from a man named Vin Deloria. Vin Deloria was a Native American author, um, theologian, historian who, for me, for my generation, uh, really spoke about the uh, situation and the status of Native American people um, as it was, as it pertains to uh, um, the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Um, so Vin Deloria was a red power advocate and essentially red power um, was a um, ideology that re received much of its sort of underpinnings from the black power movements of the uh, 1960s and 1970s. And so there was a lot of unrest by Native Americans who began to somewhat assert um, their uh, a fundamental quest for um, civil rights and freedom within the United States. And I, I suppose really what Vin Deloria is really talking about is that the history of Native American peoples has, at least vis-a-vis -vis the United States, has been one of uh, destruction or what we literally could say genocide. Um, so what he's largely doing is saying that there was a distortion of the history of Native American peoples where the United States and historians generally had sort of nicely fit the destruction of Native American peoples into the categories of Indian war rather than what, what he would argue what it really was, which was cold-blooded murder. And he was also trying to make the argument that Native American people um, at that present moment in the late 1960s uh, were suffering from the vestiges of that genocide and that there needed to be some accounting for that. So I think Vin Deloria gives us um, a lot to think about in terms of the European contact with uh, Native American people. So let's begin to sort of look or what they say is unpack these two sort of ideas of hegemony and genocide. We'll begin with hegemony. And hegemony is essentially a concept that basically states that a hegemon or a leader state or a much powerful state has rule over lesser states by implied means rather than by direct military rule. So typically what you have is when one group or one state or kingdom dominates another, this is typically done by brute force. But what Vin Deloria uh, is essentially going to talk about in some greater detail is not only the brute force that was applied to Native Americans, but in subsequent later generations, how Native Americans essentially adopted Western culture or European or white culture, and that had just as much of a deleterious effect on Native American people as did, say, uh, the military and its destruction of Native American groups. So we understand clearly what hard power does, right, brute force does, but we probably need to stand back a little bit and look at this concept of soft power, 
and how soft power works just generally. And basically what this concept is states is this, that you can have a leader state run or dominate a lesser state through what they call cultural imperialism or banal imperialism or soft power. And basically how this fundamentally works is, is that you can find alternatives to using brute force to control a people. And how you essentially do that is, is that you use culture or soft power, cultural imperialism, as a means to change people's language, change their culture so people begin to not identify themselves as part of their group anymore. They begin to dress, right, the same as the leader state. They are educated in the leader state schools. The governmental structures of the leader state are applied to the lesser state. So what you end up having is, is that the leader state imposes itself culturally on the lesser state where the people in the lesser state begin to think of themselves as members of the leader state. A really good example of this is with the country of India. Since the, literally since the 17th and 18th centuries, India was held, it was the leader state and held India, which was the lesser state and brought it into the dominion of the British Empire. So Indians, particularly the middle class and the upper classes, people like Mahatma Gandhi, they were educated in India, and they generally thought of themselves as not Indians, but as British subjects. And they, by and large, considered themselves as loyal British subjects. They fought in India's or Great Britain's wars. They uh, administered the help to administer the colonies. They were in its police forces and helped to keep uh, rule uh, or the laws. They were educated in its universities. They learned its language. They adopted its, some lots of its food customs. So people in India, particularly if you're middle class or upper middle class, saw themselves more as British than they actually did as. Indian. So, for example, Mahatma Gandhi considered himself to be a, a member of the British Empire and went to South Africa after he graduated from law school with the idea of practicing law as a British attorney. It wasn't until he found out that he was uh, not able to uh, enjoy the same rights as white British subjects that he began to realize that in fact he was not a, a British subject on the same lines um, as a uh, white person. So he began to realize that he was a British person in name only. Now, why do you suppose that would happen? What, 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 what revelations did Gandhi have when he began to really think through this enterprise? Well, the first one was, is that he was uh, essentially consistently discriminated against. And at one particular moment, he was uh, brutalized. He was actually beat up. Um, people who were not white in South Africa were forced to live apart from white people, and they all had to carry pass cards, right? Identifications labeling them in a particular race or group or category. Now, for Gandhi, what his objections were was that, look, I am a member of the British Empire. Why am I being treated any differently than, let's say, a person who was white? What, what's going on here? And what Gandhi quickly began to see is, is that the British Empire had imposed its culture on India in order to be able to extract out of India its resources. So th that's something that he had to get his mind around that Indians themselves were in fact helping the British in their process to extract out those resources from India and to gain their wealth, um, not by sheer power, although that was a component, 
but largely through soft power or through culture. So in other words, you could literally look at this and say that a person like Gandhi was aiding and abetting the British in undermining uh, and keeping people dispossessed, particularly the poor in India. So that's how uh, hegemony actually works. And this is something that we'll see later on when we begin to discuss slavery and social death in much greater detail. We'll talk about how this actual process actually begins to work in much uh, greater detail. The other concept that we have is genocide. And this is a term that was developed by Raphael Lemkin in the 1940s um, in response to the Jewish Holocaust in Europe in the 1930s and 1940s. Genocide was, uh, or a resolution was adopted by the United Nations in 1948, and the definition that they chose to adopt was the following. Any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group such as killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures to prevent births within the group, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So you have to kind of think of genocide in a much, much broader terms than the simple sort of forced acculturation or the forced killing or, or the application of force in the killing of members. You can do this by simply inflicting bodily harm. And this bodily harm can also be psychological as well. But um, as an example to this, in the 19th century, King Leopold of Belgium enslaved Africans in the Congo. And he did this to uh, use the enslaved population to extract out rubber from that region of Africa. And those Africans who didn't, who tried to escape were captured and their, one of their arms or hands were cut off. And that would be considered to be genocide. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions to bring about physical destruction. So you could take the, the um, effect of saying, we're not going to kill anybody directly or cause any bodily harm. Let's just poison all of their wells so then they'll have no water to drink. Right? That could be considered genocide. Um, sterilization, forcing women to, to, to be sterilized could be uh, considered genocide. The transfer of children. So in Australia, uh, the British stripped from thousands of Aborigines uh, their children and forced them to live with white families. And the process and the, the thinking by the British is that they were attempting to whiten um, those black children to make them less Aboriginal and more British or more white. That is considered to be genocide. Now, one of the things that we have learned from studying genocides is, is that genocide typically comes in three phases. And so we can watch events unfold in history and we can clearly begin to see some certain patterns. So let's say if today that there was a, an event occurring in the globe, people who study genocides can actually look at these events and make a determination on whether or not something is a genocide. Right now, there is the murdering of uh, indigenous people in Papua New Guinea, and it has all the patterns of genocide. And so people are looking at the patterns that's going on in Papua New Guinea, and they're discovering that, yes, perhaps there is, and, and everything indicates that genocide is being perpetrated against the aboriginal people in Papua New Guinea. But generally speaking, genocide has three distinct phases. First, it is the invasion by the leader state. And this is typically over some type of resource, i.e. land, uh, mineral wealth, 
or something, some strategic port or something that the leader state wants. And then what we have is a retaliation by the Aboriginal people, usually in the form of an insurgency. And then once this insurgency starts to develop, the leader state will develop a plan to crush the insurgency. And depending upon the severity of that insurgency, it could lead to extermination. So invasion, a, Aboriginal attacks and retaliation, and then the final solution, all are the typical phases of a genocide. And you can apply this to whether it's Native Americans in the British North America, or you can apply this to the European colonial powers, um, colonialism within Africa or colonialism within Asia. It doesn't matter. You can uh, clearly see these patterns um, over and over again with uh, genocide. Now, part of this hegemonic project that takes place also has to deal with changing the perceptions of people within the leader state and also changing the perceptions of people in the lesser state about who these people are. One of the things that we've, we ultimately see in that third and final phase, the final solution, is a caricaturing in a negative light of those particular people. So, for example, the Jews were characterized as vermin, rats, by uh, the Germans. In Rwanda, in that um, uh, Holocaust, um, one of the groups was characterized as uh, cockroaches. Um, uh, African Americans were characterized as being non-human and often characterized as uh, apes or gorillas. Um, the same thing with Native Americans. Uh, Big John, the chimpanzee chief, or there were caricatures of Native Americans in terms of um, describing them in ways that were not uh, akin to reality. Pocahontas is a, a wild exaggeration of the actual Pocahontas. Uh, Pocahontas, as we know, was a young uh, pre-puberty teen, probably around 13, 14 years old, um, was bald, didn't have hair um, and uh, for, for certain hygienic reasons and was basically covered, painted all red um, in a sort of a paste that was a mosquito repellent. But Disney has taken hold of these images and presented Pocahontas in a way that suggests that she's more European than she was actually Native American. Um, in the uh, 1940s, 1950s, and even well into the 1960s, there were also things like Indian wrestling where women would dress up as Native Americans and wrestle and men would pay uh, money to watch this, right? Um, and if you notice in this uh, uh, advertisement, if you look in the far left uh, midsection, there is a caricature of a Native American. Right, so this is really done to denigrate Native American people. It's not done in any way to honor them. So if one, if you're not caricaturing them as Big John, the chimpanzee monk, or you know, having this Indian wrestling, Native Americans often are characterized as savages, right? That used to be the, the big hallmark of Native Americans for much of American history is that Native American people were bloodthirsty savages that scalp people. And that is an absolute lie. Scalping was something that was introduced into Native American culture. It wasn't something that Native Americans themselves did. Europeans actually brought the process of scalping to Native Americans, right? So, But on the other hand, um, Americans have sort of incorporated the sort of uh, visions of Native Americans as being bloodthirsty and barbaric, right? These were some of the popular car, um, uh, magazines during the time period. These are uh, essentially comic books, the Wild West weeklies. And of course, if you can look at the covers here, the depictions of Native Americans as getting ready to scalp a, a white woman and, or 
um, you know, a Native American is getting ready to fight, you know, somebody uh, uh, from the uh, a European or a, an American, like Davy Crockett or something to that nature. Um, but these are all gross exaggerations and caricatures of Native people. Um, but they did and do exist. This is another form of caricature, right, where Native Americans were plastered on the sides of uh, American products to make people think that, well, Native Americans are in tune or in touch with the land, right? So if you buy my Warrior brand oranges, they're going to be somehow better uh, tasting or better for you simply because we've pasted the label of a Native American on the side of it. Same thing here, uh, the Ribidoux Fruit Company of California, the same thing right, with their Mountain Chief brand of oranges, right, it's the same thing. And it's quite strange because in California, right, the, the, the Native American here is a Native American of the Plains and, and not a Native American that would have been indigenous to California. These are other caricatures of uh, Native Americans, the logos of athletic teams, the Washington Redskins to the right, the Atlanta Braves, the baseball team, the Chicago Blackhawks, the hockey team, and of course, probably the most famous one is Chief Wahoo um, of the baseball team, the Cleveland Indians. Now, Chief Wahoo, um, th this is considered by most people to be the most uh, gross of the Native American characters, and Native Americans have been fighting to um, have the Cleveland Indians remove this caricature from uh, its uniforms and logos. And the Cleveland Indians finally, um, I think in, in this year, in 2018, have finally decided uh, that they will remove Chief Wahoo from all of their uh, uniforms and um, uh, advertisements and etc. Because th just generally speaking, from my perspective, these are absolutely racist. Um, I don't see how you can, on the one hand, have slaughtered thousands of Native Americans, but then at the same time plaster their pictures and their faces in the most demeaning and caricatured way on the side of uh, your helmets or your uniforms. I, I just don't see how that is. I think that this is a, a gross of uh, what we call gross of cultural appropriation, right? The, the taking of a person's culture. Um, this is one of the most fascinating aspects of the use of Native American imagery. In the 1970s, people came to the realization that littering was a problem within the United States, right? People would, you know, go on road trips or whatever, and they would buy some food or something, and as they were driving, they would just throw it at the windows of their cars. Um, so what happened is, is that the United States went on a campaign to try to get people to be, uh, pay attention and be better for the environment. Environmental groups, the Department of the Interior, et cetera, et cetera, did all of this stuff to try to get people to kind of understand that taking care of the environment was paramount. And so basically what happened is that there was this commercial where this Native American picture here uh, uh, was standing on a horizon and trash would be blowing by and this a tear fell out of the Native American's eye. You can see it here in the picture down at the bottom where in the right eye of the, this Native American that the um, um, tear is coming out of the right uh, eye. And they, why they used this particular Native American is because this Native American was well known and uh, through Hollywood. Um, this guy was a staple of Western films in Hollywood, first as a extra, and then in many ways taking some fairly um, prominent roles in movies. So most people at the time period um, could identify with this Native American in terms of uh, overall recognition. The problem with this was is that this Native American was actually not Native American. He was a white Italian from Louisiana. And how this person got the start is 
is that he wanted to be in the movies and they said that they needed more extras for Native Americans so he went and became an extra and over time he just kept doing it to the point where he just stole Native American culture and began to just appear everywhere as a Native American. When I was a, a, a child, essentially growing up, every year he was in the California, the Los Angeles Rose Parade. He was in the Macy's Parade. He was everywhere, right? And so Espera de Corti um, was one of these people who was using and taking Native American culture for his own personal gain. And essentially, that is wrong. But it illustrates, I think, for us a pattern of behavior that I think Americans have essentially um, sort of um, used or demonstrated towards Native Americans themselves. The Native Americans generally speaking, um, are called a variety of names. We generally use a catch-all name called First Nations to sort of incorporate the concept of the many Native American groups. But there are a number of names, and the one you're probably most familiar with is Indians coming from Christopher Columbus, American Indians, First Americans, indigenous people, aboriginal people, Amerindians, Amerinds, there are lots of different names that Native Americans go by. Um, it depends on where you are, who you're speaking to. I know Native American people who don't like to be called Indians, and I know Native Americans who call themselves Indians, right? It's sort of across the board. What I basically do is I ask the person, what do you like to be called? Uh, we're I grew up uh, on an actual Indian reservation in Arizona, and uh, the people for years were just simply called Indians. Um, and later on, First Nations was a big one. And then people just called them by their names, Navajo or Hopi, right? And so without the sort of, uh, sort of derogatory, uh, sort of genocidal uh, connection that that term like Indian might have. Um, but it just, for me, I feel more comfortable with asking the person what do they like to go by rather than uh, just choosing a name and saying, yes, this is, you know, an Indian or, you know, a first American or something to that nature. I usually let the person dictate how they want to be called. Now, we know of the migration out of Africa of um human beings, modern humans, and then this migration taking on uh, the, uh, the route um, through Asia, across the Bering Strait, and down into the Americas. And what we think right now, at least the DNA is pointing to, is that these Africans came over in three migratory waves. The first migration about 11,000 years ago, the second migration about 6,000 years ago, and then the third migration about 3,000 years ago. And we've looked at this map before, but this will just um, cover uh, our basis again, where um, this is the map showing where all the Native American groups were at 1600. So at the time of the uh, arrival of the Puritans and Pilgrims, we can actually see where these Native American groups are. Now, most of these Native American groups don't exist anymore, like the Pawnees were completely wiped out by um, Americans, and so they actually don't exist. And some of the groups within California don't exist either, or, or the groups are so small that they don't even really typically register um, with anybody's uh, overall consciousness um, because they're just way too small. But just generally speaking, this is where all of the Native American groups were. And we'll talk about the resettlement of some of these groups as we move a little bit further into the slides. Um, of course, these Native Americans spoke a diversity of languages. Well over 150 different languages are spoken by these Native American groups. 
they had a wide variety of housing, wigwams, pueblas, right, uh, teepees, longhouses. So the housing and cultures of these Native American groups would vary from people to people. Wigwams, teepees, longhouses, right? So the cultures would be different. Native American groups often fought against each other, sometimes when they were in close proximity um, with each other, vying for territory and space. Um, so sometimes the Native American groups banded together uh, to form large confederations for protection. Uh, sometimes the Native American groups right, were so large in, in particular case that there was no need to band with each other and they, or they just assumed other groups into their fold. Now, one of the least known aspects of Native Americans is Native American slavery. Native Americans were primary targets for slavery by Europeans as they began to settle in North America. Ponce de Leon uh, sought slaves for the West Indies as far back as 1513. Slaves from the Caribbean were shipped to British North America. Slaves from uh, British North America were shipped out of North America and sent down into uh, the uh, West Indies. Blacks and Native Americans were often exchanged by Europeans, right? So perhaps you needed more men and somebody had female uh, Indian slaves you could exchange African male slaves for uh, Native American female slaves, right? So this is a process that did in fact occur. The Rhode Island census is really good because it helps us to see how many slaves there were. Um, in 1730, there were 935 white people who lived in South Kingston and about 223 Indian slaves. In South Carolina, the population in 1708 were about 3,900 or so free whites, about 4,000 African slaves, and about 1,400 Indian slaves, right? And the number of indentured servants, about 120. So we can see from the census data and that Indians were initially part of the overall uh, slave process within early British North America. Now, so the, the question you're probably thinking about, or one that you probably may get to, is, well, what happened? Why is it that Native Americans weren't part of the longer process of slavery in the Americas, and why did it almost become uniquely an African process? And this largely has to do with germs, right? Uh, the Indians did not know what smallpox was. They had no immunities to smallpox. And as Europeans brought smallpox into the Americas, the native populations were decimated. No different than what happened to the Aztecs um, with smallpox. The same happened with the um, uh, native populations in British North America. So those populations were being wiped out um, by the thousands, and so it just made it uniquely uh, difficult to um, have large numbers of Native Americans. And on top of that, if you did capture Native Americans, it, it, they knew the territory a lot better than you did, and if they broke free, they were able to get free a lot quicker than, say, Africans who didn't know the landscape. So that made it a lot more difficult for Africans to find their way um, into the countryside and then it was for Native Americans and they could always run into other Native American groups where they spoke the language and Africans did not. So we should understand that Native American groups Right, were uh, exchanged for slaves, part of the slavery process within America, and that over time 
people began to really think about this concept here of blacks and Indians being part of the same group. So in many ways, a lot of Europeans saw Native Americans and Africans as part of the same people. And in many ways, and in some quarters, like the Seminole Indians or the Lumbee people, they were, in fact, the same group of people. So in other words, many Europeans or whites confused um, Indians and black people all of the time. Right? That, that was something that was not unheard of. Now, one of the areas that I'm going to introduce, and it's a little bit uh, further down into the time frame, but we, we might as well talk about it here, is the idea of Indian removal. So what's going to happen is, is that there are going to be some discussions about what to do about Native Americans. As more Europeans are coming into North America, there is less and less land available. The land that is uh, out there in the wilderness is occupied by Native Americans. So how do we get the land? You can either get the land either by force or you can perhaps convince the Native Americans to leave the land. So in some circumstances, the British or the French or the Americans would convince Native Americans to leave the land, they would actually purchase the land from them, right? Or in some cases, they would simply uh, tell the Native Americans that you must leave, right? Or be forcibly removed. So Andrew Jackson, who would eventually become president of the United States, uh, institute a policy of Indi Indian removal, and this was to open up lands in the southern portion of the United States where it is present day uh, Alabama and Mississippi in order to open up that land for planting. So through a both legal means and non-legal means, the um, US Congress sought to make treaties with Native Americans to try to convince them to leave the land, to open up the land for uh, uh, essentially Americans. Now, Native Americans debated on what they ought to do. Should they fight back? Should they resist? Should they sell the land? Many Na Native Americans could see that they couldn't beat the Americans, that there was just too many of them, and they had greater firepower. They were better organized. So some of them sold their land and left. Others decided that they were going to stay and fight. It was just kind of all over the map, and there was really no main consensus amongst uh, many of the Indian groups. And what you will hear um, associated with Andrew Jackson in the 1830s is this concept called the Trail of Tears. And essentially what happened is, is that the American government being led by Andrew Jackson forced the removal of about 70,000 Native Americans out of their land in the Southeast. So we're looking at, at well over 30 million acres of land. The entire whole reg region was opened up. And I'll show you a map in just a second that will kind of uh, illustrate this. And the uh, tribes that were largely affected by this were ones that they called the five civilized tribes. The Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Seminole, and the Creek. Now, these groups were in the southwestern portion of the United States, and they were literally forcibly removed from this particular area to, what, as we'll see, Oklahoma. Now, what we meant by Trail of Tears is, is that a journey of about a thousand miles that Native Americans had to walk from essentially Georgia to Oklahoma. So essentially what happens here, and your book will kind of spell this out in, little, in greater detail, is that the U.S. government 
informed the Native Americans that, that they would have to move and that there was land for them in Oklahoma. Right? And so this journey took about 100 days and three to 4,000 Native Americans died. And so these sort of the red lines will indicate the trails that the Native Americans took and along the way people died and henceforth the name the Trail of Tears. Uh, Oklahoma, present day Oklahoma was at one point called Indian Territory. And the state was essentially, or the territory, not yet a state, but the territory was divided up between these groups. So this drawing, this map highlights where these groups were settled. At one particular mo time, while this was Indian territory, there was some talk about making the state of Oklahoma an all black state. That never came into fruition. Now, you're probably going to ask, well, what happened here? Why isn't Oklahoma the, the, a state of, uh, for Native Americans? Well, essentially, um, Americans wanted that territory and wanted that land, and essentially they pushed out as many Native Americans as possible into smaller areas within the state of Oklahoma. So there are some reservations in Oklahoma, but they're much smaller than the outlines or the portions that you see here. The process of Indian removal sometimes was done by treaty. Other times it was done by forced removal. The, uh, one of the ways in which the, uh, the United States attempted to remove Native Americans was through physical force. One of the most uh, important but unknown wars in American history were the Seminole Wars. We actually fought three wars with the Seminole Nation, the First Seminole War, Second Seminole War, and Third Seminole Wars. And these wars were largely fought over the territory of Florida. The first one beginning in 1818. The Seminole um, Indians were essentially not a Indian tribe. They were a conglomeration of African slaves who had escaped from Georgia and Carolina down into Florida, and they intermingled with the native population. The name Seminole actually comes from a Spanish word, Cimarron, meaning wild. And so the Americans mispronounced the word Cimarron into Seminole, and so that's where essentially the name comes from. And this is a photograph on a drawing on the left and a photograph on the right of actually these Seminole Indians. So we can just kind of wrap up here and just kind of say that for the most part, um, you have some concepts that you can use, the idea of hegemony and genocide, and you have somewhat of a uh, sort of smaller or roundabout uh, exploration of Native American culture. So this should kind of help you to get started in at least thinking about the systematic destruction of Native Americans and how these concepts of genocide and hegemony actually mold over and fit into our concepts of uh, slavery and social death, which we will explore later on. Okay, so if you have any questions, feel free to contact me.